you got a huge tournament coming up this weekend. By the time this airs, that'll be over with and you'll yep. you'll be uh, holding bricks of cash. I'll be holding the trophy, <laughs> just like I called my shot last time. I'm going to give it all I got, all I got. I'm grinding every day, ain't no other way. Welcome to another episode of Embrace the Grind. I'm excited to have my brother back in the building for bro, it's been too long what's up bro it's so good to have you back you know i i wanted you to be a co-host but i know you're super busy we're going to get into some of the stuff that you've been busy doing um but so you, your time with us has been limited but i got to get you back on because there's been some big things going on obviously you guys know who my brother is his name is andrew moreno if you don't He's been uh, on the grind lately and I've playing. been embracing it. I've been yeah. embracing the grind fully. Which is which is one of the reasons why we had to have you on on the show. And I honestly I wanted to share something with you. I don't think you know this yet. That's uh that's big time embracing the grind. We have a sponsor for the show. What? You didn't know that, did you? She it's about time, mother <laughs> I didn't know, man. That's sick. Um I think you're gonna be pretty impressed with what the sponsor is. NBA Top Shot really yes hell yeah bro i'm so pumped to have nba top shot sponsoring this episode of embrace the grind if you guys don't know what nba top shot is it is a digital collectible nft website where you can collect digital moments of nba players nba plays nba moments and uh trade them on the blockchain with your friends they're serial numbered it's uh it's the new age of collectibles it's kind of like trading sports cards when we were kids but now it's uh, it's came into the 21st century. So I'm, I'm super excited that they're a sponsor of the show. Talk about it a little bit more on the Johnny Vibes channel. But like I said, thank you for sponsoring the show and let's get into it today. Let's do it. Uh, so let's talk about uh, some of the stuff you've been up to lately. I know you've been playing a lot of tournaments. Yeah, so uh, I've been playing a lot of tournaments lately, but um, it's been kind of weird because I'm, my wife is seven months plus pregnant, so we're, we're going on about a month and a half before our son's going to be born. Um, and I've been flying back and forth between here and Vegas pretty much every weekend. Yeah. Staying at your place. At For those of you who don't know, I picked up a place in Las Vegas. It's been, uh, it's been back and forth between here and San Diego where we are now and Vegas. I just knew that we were both taking an interest in poker tournaments. And with the WSOP coming up in October, September, October, November, that that's like football season in Vegas. You know, the hockey season's gonna be there. The Raiders are gonna be there. It's gonna be a super busy time. So I knew trying to wait until right then and trying to get like a one month Airbnb or two month Airbnb was gonna be basically impossible. So I was like, let's lock something up for six months to get us through the end of the WSOP. Found a great place at Panorama. You've already been like taking advantage of it like a every lot. Weekend. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm paying. I'm paying the bill. I have to figure. I told you <laughs> I was gonna help give you money, but so far you've been you've been struggling though lately, right? You, no, yeah. No money coming in. It's been tough, man. And that's the other thing is like, well, I mean, somehow I, I was being facetious. Okay, I was like, oh. <laughs> I was being facetious. I was there. like, what are you saying, bro? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you had a nice score lately. You officially yeah. went over the one million dollar tournament caches mark on the hendon mob congratulations bro i'm super proud of you thank you yeah it's been crazy i it's something that i've been wanting to focus on for a while is just tournament poker and recently i decided to do that uh in april so we're in was it june yeah middle of june right yeah. now Crushed Babe, it. i told you i was gonna win tournament soon yeah I I that wasn't know. that long ago <laughs> i know <laughs> And uh, since then, I've I've played seven tournaments, cashed in seven tournaments. I made two final tables, and I just won my first tournament in quite some time. So that's a pretty insane ROI. Well, it's good too. It's coming at a good time. Like you know, I'm gonna be a dad soon. I really wanted to put as much volume as I could in before our son was born. And Christy's been so great. She's like, yeah. she's like, babe, I know you want to go play, and I need you know, like you want to support the family. And she's. Yeah. super pregnant crushing the pickles and kimchi um <laughs> you know taking care of the, uh, I, the i haven't had a chance to officially uh, you know on public record congratulate you for that and it's been a long journey christy documented it on social media she made a beautiful video if you haven't checked that out i'll put some b-roll of it right now but you should definitely check it out on her channel it was really well done it's been a five-year struggle for you guys yeah it's crazy too because you know i always tell people like i knew i wanted to have kids for a long time and uh just in the last five years when we've been trying i think i really fully like feel it in my body of like what it is going to be to be a father and how bad i want it 
Whereas before, I think it was like more of a concept. You know, people would ask me like, do you want to have kids? I'm like, yeah, I want to have kids. That, that sounds like something I want to do for sure. Uh, but then that whole long, arduous journey has really got me pretty jacked up for this. Yeah. Yeah. I, know, I know with tournaments, you know, it's easy to, you know, say that I want to win a tournament. I want to commit to tournaments. But there's so much variance in tournaments that it's, it's hard to say, I'm going to take po poker tournaments seriously in April and then have these results. And, and like, you know, the romantic in me is like, oh, you just like, you crushed it and you did it. But obviously a variance plays a big role. What are your thoughts on how how much uh, your preparation was different or like why why you had this success or I, I mean, I personally noticed a few things, but do you, do you feel like the pressure of having the sun on the way was like helped you level up and perform under pressure in certain spots? I do. I think when I first found out that I was going to be a father and uh, a lot kind of comes with that. I don't even know how to really to put words on it other than it was total chaos for me just trying to think oh my god like I need to figure this out right away I need to get my life in order I need to make as much money as I possibly can so I can take some time off and I think when I sat down at the poker table with that mindset and I did a lot of study work during COVID uh, online for cash games and I thought that that would really help me um, in my in my tournament preparation also I've been working with a, a personal coach Mm -hmm. And I have um, specifically a tournament coach, a tournament right? coach. Yeah. And I've been yeah. using Razor Edge. I think it's just amazing software, good ranges. Yeah, shout out to Razor Edge. Uh, I've been working with them. I've worked with them in the past as well. I have a discount code. I'll drop it in the description. Yeah. And I always refer people because it's it's just great. It's really good stuff. So yeah. I, I was feeling really prepared, really uh, me uh, mentally prepared as well. And I think one of the things that happened when I found out I was going to be a dad was that I was just so hungry. Like I just I wanted it bad. I wanted it so bad and I, wa I feel like I wanted it more than my opponents. Yeah. And I feel like when I would sit down at a table that really helped me focus because it's like. One thing about focus that I find interesting, well, the wanting it so bad in pretty much every sport that you play, if you like really want it, you can perform better. Like if, you, if you're in basketball and you're like, I really want this and you drive to the hole harder, right? You D up harder, you, you put in that extra effort. But in poker, and in golf, that doesn't always work. Like if you swing harder in golf, it doesn't mean that you're gonna like hit it farther. <laughs> yeah. It's like such a mental game. So like in poker, if you like try harder, that doesn't necessarily, trying harder is like different. Yeah, It's it not like different. trying to win every pot, you know? Yeah, like, it's like, that's how a lot of people interpret it. <laughs> yeah, so, but what I see for you, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, um, you're trying and going for it and like uh, doing, like trying harder basically, is your focus. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's really helped me with my focus is uh, doing meditation, having a meditation practice. It really helped me to be present when I play. And I feel like it's so easy to get pulled in the past or the future when you're playing poker or have an emotion come up that overwhelms you and has you lose focus. It's just such a common thing, especially in tournament poker. Yeah. And Meditation is just a practice. It's just a constant regrounding into the present moment. It's being pulled away and then and then coming back. So um, I feel like, and especially in tournament poker, you, you you know you don't get time. You you lose that massive pot and you feel it, and immediately there's a hand in front of you, yeah. and the dealer's looking at you like, what are you gonna do right now? Yeah. Like right now. So I've, I've struggled so much with meditation because like I surround myself with people like you and Olga and Christy and you you, you guys have all been pretty good about a practice about practicing meditation i know that there's been times where i've been at your house or you've been over here and you're like i need to get away for 30 minutes because i haven't had my 30 minute meditation today and that kind of like kind of like sparked inside of me like wow even when he's like in his daily life he still is like finding time to do that because you're i think it's more because you you were on a schedule and you like don't want to miss one day of the schedule but by doing that it has for sure paid dividends from my perspective of seeing you. And as luck would have it, we actually ended up at the same tournament table. It was a massive field tournament. It was like, I mean, I, there couple had thousand. to be, yeah, there had to yeah. be a couple thousand people in this tournament and you got moved to my table, um, which is very unlucky. You know, I don't want to play with you. You don't want to play with me, but I noticed in the tournament, you, you weren't on your phone. You were focused. You were watching everything like you, you have this set other level. It's like playing above the rim. You have this other level of focus that I don't have. 
you know, when I'm when I'm struggling to um, stay in the game, sometimes I'll distract myself. I'll pull up my phone, you know, I'll do some business. Um, it'll keep me out of pots, you know, like kind of doing those things. So that is rem a reminder to me that I, I need to get into this meditation practice as well, because I understand like the the improvement in meditation and like your ability to improve your focus. It's not like a, a one month thing. Like I'm going to meditate for one month and all of a sudden I'm just going to be focused. It's like this constant, long year over year thing. And everybody that I talk to that it's like really good at meditation and, and, and has like hyper focus there, they all say meditation, but they all also say that they've been doing it for multiple years. So every time I've tried to do it, it's been like one month. Yeah. And I don't see the results because like I don't give myself time to see the results. So that has been something um, by watching you. I mean, you're my guru. You've kind of like rubbed off on me. And at this moment in time, I'm not like even having a practice, but hey, you're talking on camera. I'm going to I'm going to dedicate myself to that. Yeah, for sure. it's so important, especially in poker. I mean, you could say all the things in life, obviously, that it's so important for. Uh, just in the tournament that I ended up going on and winning, I was uh, seated at a table with this guy and it's all the little things where I just am watching every hand that I'm not in. And it's so easy again to pull out your phone or there's always a game on if you're playing in Vegas, there's just the TVs are everywhere. Um, but I just, I, again, because I want it so bad and because I'm really concentrating on focusing and watching the way that everything plays out, I picked up on just, I just always pick up on how people are playing their hands and I'm watching what's shown down, what bet sizings they're using, what lines they're taking with their bluffs, with their value. Mm -hmm. And I, I picked up a, a read on this guy who was a recreational player. I saw him bet fold a hand that was really strong. And he, then, showed, he showed it. He basically. showed it. Yeah, he showed it. Which, by the way, if you if you're a poker player and you're a recreational player, never show your cards. It's, yeah, only show when you have to. Yeah. You know, sometimes you may be out of frustration or you want to show that you made a good play or whatever. Uh, you feel like it, but just don't do it. And so, yeah, a couple of hours go by, and then I wind up in a pot with this guy where I had a hand that I normally would just fold to this guy because I knew he had a very strong hand and he's a recreational player and. Uh, we typically don't try to take recreational players off good hands unless you have a really strong hand. Yeah, the assumption is is that recreational players won't fold strong hands. Yeah. But you, you're saying you had information that told you that this guy values his tournament life very highly, that he's exactly. willing to fold very strong hands. Yeah, so then I just, I just ripped it all in with a nine high flush draw in a spot where like uh, it was pretty scary because we were both pretty deep. Mm -hmm. And he ends up folding his hand. Did he uh, fold that he, one? He showed it. He showed it too. Pocket kings on a on a uh, queen high board. So he folds pocket kings on a queen high board. Yeah. And you only did that because you knew that this guy was capable of that. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's that's exactly what we're talking about. Like, don't show your cards if you don't have to. Yeah, and a lot of the pros are on their phones. They're not like there was another pro at my table that was on his phone the whole time. He yeah. didn't see that. Yeah. You know, so there there are so many other little things. I mean, that was like a very clear example of where I picked up yeah. a nice size pot that I would have lost. But there are so many other examples of seeing the game flow and being able to react before other players. So I think in order to play at a really high level and, and, and be competitive in tournaments, you have to have that. Otherwise, you're going to be missing a lot of those little edges. And those are the difference, especially yeah. when the fields are tough. Yeah, I've noticed that usually when I bust a tournament, it's in a standard spot, you know, like I have queens and they have ace king. It's always like something that you can say, well, if I would have won that flip, it would have been different, right? Mm -hmm. But really, if you dig deep, there was a reason why I even got to that point. There was a multitude of other things that could have happened before that would have made me have a bigger stack if I would have paid attention to more things, if I would have been willing to mix it up in certain spots that I wasn't. So um, yeah, anyways, I, I want to say congratulations on 1 million Hendon Mob scores. Thank you. Awesome. The score that you had at the Venetian was first place, won it outright, busted yeah. like everybody at the table. It was pretty, it was pretty sweet. <laughs> the last thing I was going to say though about that guy is that I ended up telling him actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I told him, I pulled him aside later and I told him like. When the table was breaking? Yeah. Just like off. Yeah. Oh. And I just basically told him like what I picked up and why I did what I did and that I did bluff him. And uh, he was very grateful. And I think uh, those are the kind of things that I think as a professional, it goes a long way with, with, with a recreational player because 
you know, you give them a, a nice piece of information and you kind of like reaffirm to them that, mm -hmm. you know, like, yes, obviously we're trying to beat you and we want, yeah. but I don't need you to be this really bad poker player. Like I'd like to share this thing with you. So yeah. I don't, I don't always do that, but he was particularly nice. So yeah. I think that um, that goes a long way to keeping him involved in the poker scene to to have him want to continue because like he sees the good in poker as well. So kudos for doing that. Uh, I, so sticking with the topic of uh, mindfulness and meditation, there's uh, there's I kind of wanted to get in some health stuff. Yeah, you've been it's always interesting with you because for the last, I don't know, good at least five years, I know you've been struggling with a lot of. I wouldn't call it like serious health issues, it's but not, not chronic debilitating stuff. Yeah. But there's always been, you've always been plagued. And I know you've been recently going to Mexico, I think, and yeah. you know, doing stem cells. What, what's going well, on? Well, I've always been that? super healthy, yeah. you know, and like athlete workout, just like always been someone who was active, never had a weight issue other than like losing a little bit of weight. And I remember Olga and I went our, were on our road trip back in the end of 2019 and we were listening to like biohacking uh podcasts because we were listening to a lot of podcasts on the road trips driving two two three thousand miles and they we looked at each other and we're like let's make 2020 a year of like figuring out how to optimize our health we were like all in we were super jazzed about it and it was funny because at this time i was i was having like a lot of low energy and I would, I would get winded climbing stairs. I thought it was just because I was getting older. Maybe my testosterone was lower. Maybe my cardio was, wasn't where it should be. But I was like, when we get back to San Diego, let's go down to Mexico. Let's get all of our blood work done. And we'll, we'll, go, we'll take it from there. And at the end of 2019, I think it was December, we went down, got all our blood work. And they, at the hospital, they gave me my blood work back. And they're like, you need a blood transfusion. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, your iron levels, your, your blood oxygen levels are dangerously low because you have anemia. And at the time, I didn't really understand what that meant. And I, so I started reading about it, like, what is anemia? And you know what's really interesting about this is that people on YouTube had for months, multiple times, had messaged in the comments, Johnny, are you okay? You look like you have anemia. And I just thought that they were haters. Yeah, because there, there's like, you always get like random comments like that. And it's, you don't really put much stock in it when, when it's something like that. But it's so bizarre that people in YouTube comments are somehow diagnosing you successfully. I, I was blown away. When they you were look. like, you have anemia. I was like, I, all the comments on YouTube were like, Wow. You're like, what else do they write about? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then I, I was like, okay, well, what is a blood transfusion going to do? They're going to be like, well, well, when they said that they were like, well, you'll feel like a normal human being for a couple of days. Like you won't feel like you can't climb stairs. And I was like, yeah, but what about after a couple of days? They're like, well, you'll return to normal. You, you'll be like dangerously low blood oxygen. I'm like, well, if that's just a temporary fix, like I don't really want a blood transfusion. Give me the, the real fix. So they gave me um, the supplement that I've been taking called, called Floridix. And they're like, your iron levels are going to come up eventually, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, and it, your, your body's eventually going to fix itself. I, and uh, I, I was taking uh, this Floridex and it's been a year. And it took one year to get my iron levels from basically dangerously low, like on the verge of needing blood transfusions to in the normal range. So that's how long it actually took me to get there. And you're taking the supplement daily? Yeah, in the mornings. It's just okay. like a little, uh, it's like fruit fruit juice. Okay. Um, just like a tiny little sip. And uh, everything was great. And then I got COVID. <laughs> and like, I, I was actually very careful because I knew that my blood oxygen stuff, I really did not want to get COVID at the um, when everybody else was getting it. But ended up getting COVID. And um, after that, I turned 40. So then like I still was having some um, energy issues. So got more blood work and had some like brain fog and things like that. And like they're like your your anemia is good now. You're, you're, you don't have the dark circles under your eyes anymore. And I felt like a little bit better through like exercise and stuff. But I would still have moments of like 
wow, I feel like I'm going to faint or like, you know, my heart rate is high, but I feel tired, you know. Um, and they're like, well, we, we have this other thing that you can try. It's stem cells. And so I started doing all my research on stem cells. And, you know, I know the owner of the hospital. And he gave me a decent deal. He's like, you, you can try the stem cells. So I did this two weeks ago. I haven't even really told you about. Yeah, I'm really curious about how you. Um, and we know a, a mutual friend. I, I actually don't know the story that you told <laughs> me before. You, you withheld the name. Actually, why don't you tell the story? On, because like, I feel like it's interesting. I don't even know who this person is, by the yeah, way. Um, yeah, so a friend of mine. Uh, same was, hospital. Same hospital. Yeah, he went down there to get some uh, stem cells put in. Uh, and he had him injected into his penis. Um, you told me that story and I was like, why? Yeah, and I was why like, would anybody you know, inject anything into their penis? I mean, yeah, I mean, I had questions, man. But um, yeah, apparently he said it's it's been like working really great for him. Like um, he had um, uh, erectile dysfunction issues. Yeah, yeah. And he said like it's like really he said he feels like a young man again. And I mean, you know, it's just this stuff really is apparently like like this we're not like uh, we're not doctors by the way yeah no. this is not like health. medical advice not this financial is not medical advice. advice this is just anecdotal this, this isn't even life advice <laughs> yeah this is anecdotal experiences that have between us like yeah my personal experience and his friends person i think that we pr i probably know him you just won't tell me who he is yeah. <laughs> um but it's you fascinating said, yeah but you said that he he also gained some uh some apparently there was <laughs> there was some uh, girth reported but uh I, I i couldn't confirm from the photos i saw <laughs> i didn't see any photos no i know about you and your your, your photos with <laughs> no, no no if you no. see a previous episode we'll know you know what oh talking yeah about. that's right yeah no yeah um so anyways yeah i went down there and i, I did stem cells i did like nad plus and i did like all these hyperbaric chambers ozone therapy and stem cells. They just intravenously gave me some stem cells. It was, it was still expensive, um, but I trusted, I trusted the people that owned the hospital and uh, they had mentioned that they had been seeing really good results. And a week had went by and I didn't really like notice anything. And I, I, was, uh, I was like, maybe it just didn't work for me, you know? And then two days ago when I was in Vegas, I had a work day where I woke up at like seven in the morning and I literally made two videos. I worked basically the entire time. I went downstairs, I worked out and it had like a 14 hour day and I felt great the whole day, which is like not normal for me. And then I woke up, and I went to bed, woke up the next day, like jumped out of bed. I don't jump out of bed. Like, you know how we are. <laughs> That's crazy. I like jumped out of bed, yeah. um, went, had breakfast and like, I was just like, I was like so charged up. I was like, let's, let's take on the world today, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I, 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 I did some running around. I um, had a couple meetings. I get home and I'm like, I need to do something. So I went downstairs. I worked out. I worked out harder than I have than I can ever remember. Like it was the most intense workout. And I had a full day, worked, went to bed at like three in the morning. Woke up at 8.30 the next morning, like jumped out of bed and I'm like, I need to go work out. Like, so I worked out again the next morning and I've never experienced energy like this. And I, this is like I said, anecdotal, but we're a week and a half in from this experience. And if it continues like this, this has been like one of the best decisions that I, I, I feel like I'm 25 again. It's just yeah. been absolutely mind blowing. I, I've been wanting to tell you about it. Um, you, I mean, I noticed it today, actually. So we were out with our family at Dave and Buster's and uh, I wanted to tell you then, but I was like, we're going to have a conversation tonight. So I figured I would just tell you on camera. Yeah, I just noticed like uh, your energy levels have been higher. I, I mean, yeah. it's you know, I spend a lot of time around you. So um, is it something that you have to do like every week, every month? No. Every so couple months? they what, said what they that um, when they when I they followed up with me a week later and I was like, I don't really feel like I've noticed anything, you know, um, they're like, sometimes it can take uh, months for you to notice something. And sometimes you don't notice anything at all. Uh, but now, a couple of days later, they said, um, well, they also said that after a year and a half, you're not going to notice anything like it's worked its way out of your system. If, if you haven't felt anything after like a year, year and a half it's done with. So people that are doing stem cell therapy, maybe they inject it into their knee to repair cartilage or something like that. It's something that 
can work for like a year, but then you have if it's if you have like a chronic thing, you have to take it like every so often, like a, every year and a half or so. But you know, this is not FDA approved in America. Um, so the only way that I was able to do this was by going to Mexico. Yeah. What's the price range on something like that? Well, what's interesting is NAD plus is another uh, treatment that I was getting down there. And when I was in San Antonio, Texas on the road trip, I went into this, uh, to this health place because I had this thing called class pass where you can go to different like classes mm -hmm. and studios when you're in different cities. It, it's kind of great for traveling people. And I went to this like wellness place and they had NAD plus on the, on the menu. And it was $2,000 for NAD treatments, NAD plus treatments. Wow. And that's just like a one-off treatment? Yeah. And so like I, in Mexico, I, I think I was paying 200. So it's okay. like one tenth of the price. But you, you, you were friends with the Friends owner. and family discounts. Yeah, like so I it, it'd probably be a it, bit it more It may be that, a little bit still, more yeah. for the general person that walks yeah. in the hospital. But the, the stem cells, I think probably would be at least 60% less than it would be in Europe because they're doing this in they do this in Russia, they do this in Europe. For some reason they don't do it in America. I'm not exactly sure why. Like I said, I'm not a health professional. Seek health professional advice. I'm just giving you my personal experience on this. And I thought it was so compelling that I wanted to share it on uh on on this podcast. I I'm generally just so honest with my audience. I always am. So yeah, I've been feeling great lately and uh, I was excited to share it with you. Um yeah. I definitely, I feel like I need to, I'm going to play that big tournament, the to win tomorrow. Yeah. If I could just take some, some stem cells and like shoot them into my veins and just. No, I, I, I don't know cognitively if it's going to help me. Yeah. Um, but I, I do know that I've had some increased energy. That's good to hear. Well, you have to keep us updated. Yeah, no, I will. Um, I'll keep you up. I'll keep you updated, obviously, yeah. but, um, I'll probably talk more about it if, if I notice anything on, on, uh, here on Embrace the Grind. And obviously I, I, I make Instagram stories all the time. Uh, another well, thing that's happened recently is- I was uh, just gonna bring up this Twitter thing that I saw. Oh yeah, we can talk about that too. Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, one of my favorite things to do on social media is just scroll poker Twitter. There's always crazy things on there. Sometimes there's dramas and beefs that are interesting. Every once in a while though, there's a story that actually feels kind of good to read. And I hadn't even spoke to you at all. And then I saw your name on this really long thread and it was just so much happened. So you, do you want to fill me in a little bit or fill us yeah. in? Yeah, um, what you're talking about is uh, we were both at the same wedding. Yeah. Um, we were at Gary Gates' wedding. Shout out to Gary Gates and Marissa for tying the knot. Beautiful wedding, by the way, in Cabo. And it, it was an all-inclusive resort. We were having drinks. It was just one of those weekends where it was carefree, it was fun. And I was feeling the love, you know, but I also, uh, it was also a really bad weekend for crypto. Uh, we've had a few of those recently. I think my portfolio lost like 35% in a weekend, which was a massive swing for me. What's weird is that like, I've never actually touched that money. Like I've never had it in my hands. So I don't really feel the swings as much because it does almost doesn't even feel like real money to me. But when it when you're talking six figure swings and 35% of your portfolio, it still like has some sort of impact into my psyche. Um, not as much as like a six figure swing would have on my poker psyche. Like that would just destroy me, obviously, um, because like that's like money that I'm like dishing out and like I can feel it in my hands, you know. Yeah, that's what I did last year. Yeah, <laughs> right, go ahead, no, go ahead. I've survived, so you can go. <laughs> um, so anyways, yeah, I was, I was feeling a little like, ugh, about, about that. And uh, having drinks at the pool on a Sunday and Veronica, ha, uh, this, this girl that's popular in the poker community, she, uh, she's been organizing a fundraiser for a guy by the name of KL. He is a quadriplegic and that's, that's, I didn't really know much about him. I just knew that he was a quadriplegic and that he was very heavily involved in the poker community. I think he has been for a while. He, yeah, he's, he's been around. For a he's, while. um, he's also a solid player. He's part of the, the, um, I think it's learn poker, learn it's, uh, Ryan LaPlante, Ryan LaPlante's yeah. coaching site. He's Which part is of good. I mean, Ryan's great. I mean, yeah. what, I'm sure if he's working with them, he's yeah. So, so just by association, like he, he's got to know what he's doing. You know, he takes the game super serious. He's actually attended one of my meetup games. Um, my online meetup games back when we were doing it on Zoom. I think this was like 
um, April of 2020. He participated a couple of times. Uh, so I have met him on camera, but I didn't really know much about his story. So when Veronica reached out to me and was like, help me uh, raise awareness for KL so we can get them in this van because the van that he's currently in is broken down. He wants to come to the World Series and like his family, you know, doesn't have any money. And is there anything you can do to help? And, you know, feeling the love from the wedding, having a few uh, drinks at an all-inclusive resort, also feeling a little like weird about the crypto downswing. I was like, you know what? It's only money. Like, let's do something nice for KL and let's bring awareness to this. Let's have a Twitter campaign where every time somebody retweets my awareness uh, for KL's cause, I will donate money per retweet. And I remember I typed up the tweet and I was like, I'll donate $1 for every retweet. And then I, I went through my profile and I was like looking at my profile and I, I you know, sometimes I get a hundred likes or something, but retweets, people don't retweet stuff, you know? And I had never really had anything retweeted more than like five or 10 times. So I was like, what's $1 gonna do? Yeah. You know, I wanna donate more than $10 to this. <laughs> yeah. And I wanna bring some awareness. Like maybe I should do more than $1. $2? Well, $2 is weird. Like, let's make it a nice, like, chunky, even number. Let's go $5. $5 per retweet. I'm sure that, like, people will get excited about that and a couple, you know, and maybe we can raise a little bit of money. Maybe I'll end up sending, maybe I'll get retweeted 100 times and I'll send them $500. Like, $500 is great. Like, good cause. So I tweeted out. I'm laying at the pool. Flight later that night. Back to San Diego. Back to Tijuana. We're going to cross the border from Tijuana. Put the phone down, grab a drink, pull the phone back up five minutes later, you know, cause I'm addicted to Twitter. I'm addicted to the internet, <laughs> I'm addicted to my phone. And uh, 15 retweets in five minutes. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. I'm like, that's, that's getting retweeted pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so then I, I'm like, oh, well, I don't, you know, maybe it's just, maybe it's just like an anomaly. And then, uh, and then uh, Danielle Moon gets a hold of it. And she starts tweeting at Phil Helmuth and uh, Steve Aoki. And, and hey, guys, uh, let's... You're uh, blocked by them, bro. <laughs> well, not Aoki, but Helmuth. <laughs> I'm blocked by uh, Phil Helmuth. That's right. Um, she's like, let's, uh, let's blow this up. Let's, let's, let's get KL a van. The goal was $70,000. And they had planned to try to raise the $70,000 over the course of, a, you know, six months. And um, so, like... Let's get the 70,000 in one day. Let's make Johnny Vibes go broke. <laughs> so then I started seeing like Phil Helmuth. By the way, Phil Helmuth, I think he blocked me because of a, because of an episode of Embrace the Grind. We talked about Phil Helmuth uh, not studying and how like white magic like probably isn't going to work against the solver area. Well, he just, just he just white magic Daniel Negreanu for three straight matches. So. And he white magic Antonio Spandiari. He, he's backed it up every single time. Anyways... I think that he saw those clips and he blocked me because he wasn't happy about it. It was a clip that was around Twitter and everything. Anyways, she tweets at Phil Helmuth. Phil Helmuth unblocks me, retweets it. Then not only does Phil Helmuth retweet it, Doug Polk sees it and says, let's ruin Johnny Vibes. <laughs> and he retweets it and he says, let's, let's, uh, yeah, let's make Johnny Vibes go broke and let's get KL Levan. By the time I see all of this going on, we're at like a hundred retweets right now. And obviously that's $500, but like we're an hour in. And yeah. I'm like, this is gonna be bad. I just knew that once I had said it, I couldn't take, my, I couldn't take it back. Yeah, of course. You know, not. like yeah. once you say these things, you just gotta like roll with it. But the, uh, the unknown of not knowing where it was gonna end. And, and I remember we, we got to the airport and at this point I'm refreshing my phone like every, you know, five seconds because 100 150 retweets then when doug got a hold of it it went it went to a thousand and i'm like okay we're at five thousand dollars now and like this could actually go to fifty thousand dollars you know and i was texting my friends like what do i do like i really messed up here like i don't i don't know if i'm going to be able to like pay fifty thousand dollars in one day you know like yeah. um so anyways i get on the airplane and no Wi-Fi in Mexican airspace. So I have to sit there for three hours in flight. Probably just drinking more. Knowing uh, that, 
knowing that I got on the airplane with 1,200 retweets and not knowing where it was going to end. And when I got off the airplane, the first thing I did was refresh. And it was at like 1,540 retweets. And it was like middle of the night. And I was thinking like, this is probably going to be pretty close to where it ends because it had slowed down a lot. We were, it was already like midnight. So I made a video, so I made a video saying, I'm just going to round up to, to, uh, $10,000 because like, I, I know that retweets will trickle in between 1500 and 2000. And by the way, they ended up stopping somewhere in the 1900 range. So rounding up, uh, covered everything. And I watched some of the footage of the fundraiser, the KL fundraiser. And when they were talking about ruining Johnny vibes, you know, it was, it was kind of all in fun, but I could see in Kale's face that like, wow, if Johnny were to donate $10,000, that would be insane. Like the look on his face when he was like, oh my gosh, if we can get it to $10,000. I saw that and I was like, I just want to make that happen for him. And not like having some connection to him, but also knowing that it meant so much to him. So I did that and I rounded up and, you know, it did, it did like, um, it did put me outside of my comfort zone in terms of how much money it was for me. But I think that that's what made it so great because like whenever people do things that are good or they like do things that are, uh, are big in their life, if it stretches them outside of their comfort zone, then there's like, then it's even bigger, you know? So I felt really good about it. And then a couple days later, uh, I actually had a phone call with KL and his dad. We talked for about an hour and a half on the phone, maybe an hour. And uh, his dad gave me the full scope of their financial situation. And he gave me the full scope of what KL has to deal with on a, on a daily basis. And I had no yeah. idea. And yeah. I'll give you some of, the, some of the cliff notes of that. He's had this ailment since he was born. And when How old is he? He's in his 30s, early 30s. Okay. I think he's 32, if I remember correctly. And the doctors told Kale's parents that he wasn't going to live past three years old. Why are you doctor? Every time I hear the stories from the doctors, it's like, you'll never walk again. You'll never live. And yeah, I mean, and he has to, I mean, so, I, yeah. so yeah, obviously he's outlasted three years old and you know, every night he has to uh, sleep on a, on a ventilator because like his lungs aren't capable of keeping him alive throughout the night. And his dad is there to like help him through all of this. I mean, his dad obviously looks at his cards at the poker table for him and, yeah. and he tells him what to do, but he has like micro movement in one in his finger. Uh -huh. So he can like barely move the joystick to like turn his like thing and everything like that. And um, so once I got the full scope of what KL has to go through, I felt so silly thinking about how detrimental money was going to be in my life. You know, what he has to deal with on a daily basis trumps money millions times over. And once I kind of took that in, I felt so grateful that I was able to help him. And not only did my $10,000 go a long way towards reaching the goal of $70,000 because it got retweeted almost 2000 times, all these people on poker Twitter, that would have never donated. They saw that because it showed up on 2000 people's infinite infinity. You know how um, that works with exponential growth. It saw all those people saw that and then perhaps donated to the cause because I was able to bring more awareness to it. And a goal that they thought it was going to take maybe six months to reach. They reached it in one day. That's so cool. And, and like to be able to have a part in that. I just feel like I said, overwhelmed with gratitude and something that started out was, you know, that was like a lot of anxiety for me turned out to be one of the proudest moments in recent memory. So yeah, it it's sounds great. Like it was a real like kind of moment of growth for you in a way. It was. And, and that's the thing is like, we're not like we're human beings, you know, like we're not above being attached to money or you know, any of these things. And I, th I really appreciate you being like upfront and honest with the, about this, because I know it's like, you know, we, we'd like to have everyone think that we're just these like 
totally benevolent people that have everything figured out and you know obviously like you are really giving and caring but there was a whole process here for you and you went through it and you learned and you grew and i think sharing that with everyone is is really valuable yeah yeah i feel great about it and uh he got the van dude I, it's so cool man and you know what i feel like just when my car is in disarray like i feel like my life is in disarray and he's got he's his deal is way more intricate because he's got a like move in and out of this thing it's like mm-hmm. it's almost like it's just such an integral part to his life mm-hmm. and if it's in disarray and if it's like breaking down i can't imagine what kind of stresses that adds on him and his family and what a crap country to be having this condition and we're like everything in their, our healthcare system costs 10x what it would in other countries i just how can anyone afford to to be yeah. i mean you're saying on a ventilator and for like 30 years like what what kind i can't imagine the hospital bills yeah i mean i think uh i think it's about time for him to have some good some run good yeah know? no so. definitely and um they they videotaped they videoed uh the van pulling up and him seeing the van for the first time yeah and how i could see it on his face he was just like so happy and he rolled up on the ramp and he like bumped his head a little bit uh, like as he was like getting in there oh. and he likes he got in he started spinning around and he's like <laughs> laughing <laughs> that's so he's cool he's just like loving it yeah and his dad was like taking video of it and he's like oh my god it has a a sunroof they like you can see the raindrops falling on the sunroof his dad like picks up the phone and like tries to go through the sunroof to look down at him yeah. but it's tinted windows uh. just like the excitement of like seeing that it felt so good and I got emotional even just like looking at it. It was, it was really cool. So, you know, it's half the battle and I'm actually going to throw a link to uh, Kale's fundraiser down in the description if you guys want to donate because like I said, getting the van, the $70,000 to uh, convert the van and everything, that's only half the battle. He, he, we're trying to get him to come to Vegas for the World Series and, you know, handicap accessible hotels, all of the the travel expenses that go with coming to Vegas. Um, Where does he live? He lives in Missouri okay. or Illinois. Illinois. He lives in Illinois, um, and you know, getting there is it's not just him. You know, he has to come with his dad, and his dad has to leave work and come uh, take care of his every need. So, uh, you know, that's half the battle is getting in the van. So, if anybody feels compelled to donate more to the cause to help get kale to the to the world series of poker this fall i'll drop a link to the gofundme any of that help would be appreciated man crazy story i mean and the the weird thing about all this is for me personally is just seeing this on twitter you know and haven't spoken to you about it and just it's kind of it's just weird to see something go viral with your brother in it and then just kind of like it moves so quickly yeah. and I'm trying to like track what's going on and uh, to have you be at the center of all this was just like a really cool. Uh, yeah. I, I remember, I remember the text from you. You're yeah. like, what happened? Well, yeah. <laughs> what's going on on Twitter? I was like, because hey. if you, if you didn't, if you weren't following the story the whole day, you wouldn't really understand like how everything happened. Yeah. I just like the first thing I saw was like Doug Polk was like, let's ruin Johnny vibes. And I was like, okay, well, how is this, yeah this happening right now so yeah it was a whole thing but yeah so um yeah uh, it's great to have you back on the show uh catching up i, I want to do this thing where we kind of chat uh once every at least once a month especially now that we're both going to be in las vegas a bunch grinding tournaments las vegas is going to be great too because it's a hotbed for a lot of our friends and a lot of people that people would find very interesting on embrace the grind so um i'll be able to i'll be able to get a lot of guests on and you know, I have a lot of uh, upcoming guests that are going to be super sick. That are going to provide a lot of value for the audience. You got a huge tournament coming up this weekend. By the time this airs, that'll be over with, and you'll yep. you'll be uh, holding bricks of cash. I'll be holding the trophy, <laughs> just like I called my shot last time. What's up, guys? Welcome to this intermission that I have to fill you guys in on. I'm currently at the Win Millions $10 million guarantee tournament. Yeah, I think things are about as good as I could possibly hope for right now. I'm in, I'm in contention, so I have an amount where really anything could happen. And 
actually this is my biggest score to date. Um, oh, yeah. I'm not too far from my original goal of seven figures, so what only four at? people between me. Andrew is in the final three of the Win Millions tournament. I had to insert this into Embrace the Grind because we had just talked about it and the episode hadn't even aired yet. So we're gonna sit down with Andrew. We're gonna play this out and see what happens, see how much money he actually wins in this thing. Why don't you let him know what happened, brother? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, this says a lot right here. Uh, and also this behind us here. Uh, there's a check back there. There's a check back there if you can't see it. I don't know if it's in frame or not. It says $1,460,105. I think it's actually off by a dollar. I think that it's $106 if we're splitting hairs here. But congratulations, you won $1.5 million in a poker tournament. I almost can't believe it. I ha I've, I've been pinching myself for the last day or so. When the final card came down on the river, I wanted to tackle you but i knew that you had to congratulate your opponent on yeah and then as soon as you did do you that you got me dude you I, fucking got me i you tackled me, you, you like picked me up it was like it was really special for me because when something like that happens where you're you're i was in a poker tournament for six days and you know you're playing 10 12 hour days every day and all you're thinking about is poker every decision you make is just you're in the zone, you're, you're completely focused on the, the theory, the strategy, and then right up to the, like, the time when the hand came down, like I was all in or whatever, I was still in that complete poker mode where I just couldn't, I couldn't even like think about anything other than the game. Mm -hmm. But then when you grabbed me and picked me up, it was like, it was kind of like the universe telling me like, this is over, like you won it. Like you can snap out of that poker mode and, um, yeah, I feel like that really helped me initially just like kind of like realize like what was happening. Yeah, if you can't hear it in our voices, uh, it's been a, a couple of days of drinking after that. We we saw Miley Cyrus last night. It's been a fun couple of days. It's the morning time now. So we're trying to get our bearings about us and uh, and recap what's happened. I mean, we, we talked about your poker journey in the very first episode of Embrace the Grind and how you were grinding low stakes, one, three, no limit, basically for the first five years of your poker career. You know, you're nearly 20 years deep into your poker career now. So, so. imagine, you know, being, I, I guess at this time I was probably 20, 21 years old. Christy was 18, 19 years old and we moved out to Vegas and uh, basically with no money. I was a one, three, no limit player with, you know, $500 to my name. And uh, it was hard. <laughs> it yeah. was really tough. So that uh, time grinding one three, it's just so amazing to see you um, mature into a ten million dollar guarantee poker tournament, prestigious poker tournament, probably the biggest poker tournament that there has been since the WSOP main event of 2019, with all of the best players in the world playing it, firing multiple bullets. You know, there was a potential for six bullets being fired in this thing by the Jason Coons of the world, by, you know, the Daniel Negranus and all these Alex Fox and Kristen Bicknell. They were all in there firing as many bullets as necessary. Um, and I, that was actually one of the reasons why I didn't play the tournament is because I didn't think that I would have a skill edge or would be equipped to handle that many bullets. And uh, you decided that it was your time. You were on a little heater. You'd been working on your game. Two months ago, you tweeted out that you were gonna start taking poker tournaments serious and you wanted to cross 1 million in Hendon mob earnings and you wanted to have your first $1 million score was two things that you declared on the internet a couple months ago. And to basically cash every single tournament that you have played since that point, eight for eight, three final tables, two wins, one of them being for $1.5 million, it's almost unreal. Like I don't, you can't even really write the the script any better than that. And I'm just so proud as your brother and so excited to tell everybody on Embrace the Grind that we have a, a poker champion here, one of the most prestigious uh, tournaments of the year, Andrew Moreno, uh, now over two and a half million dollars on the okay. Hendon Mob. So the other, one thing I was gonna say is that <clears throat> I actually have spent an insane amount of time grinding low stakes poker at the win. When I first moved to Vegas, it was really where I played 1-3 mostly, and it's pretty much what I played was 1-3 for a long period of time. And there is something special about doing it there for me because it's kind of this culmination of like where I started and where I am now. 
and you know just knowing all the floor staff and the dealers and I mean the event was incredible you hear people talk about it for all over it's been all over Twitter people have been very happy about the tournament just <clears throat> the the way that it was run the structure uh, the they really listened to the players it was it was incredible um, one thing that I, I think initially like when we recorded the first uh, a couple like a, about a week ago I had a little bit of reservation about playing the tournament for the same reason you did because you have all the best players in the world firing six bullets potentially to get a big stack to go on to day two you're essentially guaranteed to play against all of them at least on day two most of them with a big stack so that's a that's a really challenging proposition uh, especially if you only want to fire one or two bullets because they can be a lot more they can push a lot more edges against you because if it doesn't work out they can jump back in for you you know you may be are going to you know give up a lot of uh, mm -hmm. spots to them so yeah i was a little concerned but a big part of me i just wanted to really i wanted to test myself i really wanted to put myself in the lion's den with the best and and i know i can i can hang with them it's not i think a lot of times we feel like we have to beat them you know like i in my mind sometimes i can go to like oh i have to beat jason coon to win this title i have to beat chidwick to, to win this title and that's just not how it is. All I have to do is sit down and play my best game to the best of my ability. Every situation, just focus in on my table and don't worry about all that other stuff. Yeah, okay, Kuhn might be at my table and then, and then maybe I do have to play spots versus him. But unless we're heads up, I don't have to beat him to win this thing. Yeah, that's huge. And there's obviously when you win a poker tournament that is a six-day tournament, there are so many hands that we could talk about and you and I have gone back and forth on some of the most insane hands that you played and there's at least uh, six half a dozen or so hands that were just like you know mind-blowing that we can't really get into on this episode but there's one in particular that I did want to talk about and it was it was when we were down to under 18 players and you were um, in a blind versus blind battle and uh, you had a, a choice on the river to hero call for your tournament life um, on a significant pay jump. You know, if you would have called and lost, you would have been out of the tournament and forfeited uh, um, maybe $25,000 yeah. $25, yeah. or something if you had made the wrong decision there. Um, and then the safe decision obviously is to fold, you know, preserve your tournament life and try to accumulate chips in another way. Uh, why don't you walk us through that hand because it was, uh, it was on fire on Twitter a lot of people were talking about it and it was uh, something that was super interesting yeah um, I guess I don't know how technical I'll get on the analysis I'll just say that when I put the hand together in my head I really felt like I felt like I, I needed a call mm -hmm. like I put everything together and I ran through the entire hand I thought very well I, I thought I had a good handle on what I expected my opponent to do and how I expected him to play and the kind of hands that I was going to arrive to the river with and the kind of hands that I would like to to ideally call this bet with and that I knew that my hand class was right in there for something that I would want to potentially call with. Uh, the, the thing that was really interesting I think about it for me was that it's such a big moment you know it's it's a big 10k buy-in we're approaching the final table it's late on day five there's just so much pressure. I have the entire other table is just standing around me watching all the spectators, the, the media, just waiting for me to make this decision. It's been, you know, three to five minutes, I'm thinking. And ultimately, I decided to make the call because I knew I had to do it for myself. I, I, I thought it was the right decision. And when you're a hero and you're wrong, it looks terrible. And everybody like has something to say about it and you feel dumb and a lot of money is lost when you're wrong and I just knew that if I if I folded and I went against what I what I thought I should do that I I wouldn't be okay with that and I just I had to do it for me yeah for context the hand was uh, basically and Andy had a Andrew had a bluff catcher with second pair 
and there was a four card straight on the board so any nine made a straight and there was also a flush on the board so obviously a flush could win as well so um there's obviously a lot of hands that he could have to um to beat second pair you know uh so it was a huge call a huge moment and it set you up for you know winning the thing obviously um because you would have been very short stacked if you would have folded not very short stacked but you would have been battling uh, but you never really had a commanding chip lead or anything. You just kind of made the right decisions to keep you in the game. And then that huge hero call, a couple uh, a couple really fortuitous hands along the way. And, you know, before you know it, you're three-handed making yeah, a deal. That, that journey was kind of crazy because when I made the final table, I was one of the short stacks. There were three of us that were pretty, sh like, quite short. And then there were a couple really big stacks that were just pushing us, everyone around. And you're not really thinking about winning at that point. I mean, I'm not. I'm, I'm mostly thinking about what it, my exact strategy is based on my chip position in relation to the other chip stacks. And that continually changes. Uh, and my strategy has to change hand by hand based on that. So I was just focused on that. And I made a nice trap where I slow played Kings preflop and I doubled up mm -hmm. and that was huge. Yeah. And I think a lot of, a lot of professionals would have trapped my hand, but a lot, most people just go all in with my hand. I had 13 big blinds, which was very short stack and I was mm -hmm. facing a raise and I was in the big blind mm -hmm. people. You can't really make a size where you like three bet small. Yeah. So you, you, most people just go all in and that would have been, that would have been a, a pretty big mistake. So that was really huge. And then when we got, yeah, I just slowly like hung around and didn't make any mistakes. I really feel confident in saying that. I had my poker coach there with me and you know, we were talking in between almost every hand. And when we got three handed, we discussed a deal, which was also like a really interesting situation. I don't know. You know, you're talking about negotiating where there's $1.2 million between third place and first place. So that's just massive. So the chip distribution was like, I was in third, the, uh, the other good professional, uh, he was in second by a, I had 13 million, he had 17 million, and then the other good professional had around 22 million, 23 million. So we were trying to negotiate and, you know, it's just high pressure and there's tons of money on the line. You're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. One guy's like asking me to give him money uh, to make the deal. And like, it was a small, a small figure in relation, maybe 25, 50,000. I don't even recall at this moment. And I'm just like, no, I'm not doing that. Like, and, and the other guys like, we're not, you know, I'm not doing it. And they're like, no deal. Let's play. Uh, you know, and then. Which essentially is like, now you're, you're playing like a half a million dollar sit and go. If you, there's no deal. Well, yeah, I mean, it's $1.2 million. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, it's a $1.2 million swing. If I bust right there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's just so big. Um, and I think we all kind of recognize that the variance, the thing is like, even if the good professional has a 5% edge on me here and we're playing for $1.2 million, do you really want to push 5% for that number? Most people would probably say no, unless you, you have millions and millions of dollars. So uh, we ultimately did decide on a deal uh, that was based strictly on our chips and then we left money to play for and um, yeah it was it was just a really interesting yeah. dynamic 1.5 million dollars in the bank I I don't I already know that your life's not gonna change just just knowing you you yeah. um, I just want to say one more thing actually about the the three-handed play and like the final table in general so when I showed up at the final table nobody thought I was gonna win there wasn't one person at my table that believed that I would ever be the guy to win. I knew that I could and I believed in myself and I felt like I could. And I know my friends and family there believed in me. And that, that's just an interesting situation to be in when you're playing, when everybody is worried about the chip leader, the second chip, every, no, everyone's counting me out. No one's thinking I can do it. Every step of the way, no one thought I could do it. And I know when I got three handed, I could feel it. They knew I was a force to be reckoned with and I was the shortest stack, but I could feel their energy totally shifted. And when I got heads up and after the other guy busted to the chip leader, I was at a pretty significant chip disadvantage. I believed I could do it. 
uh, and the chip leader, he started whittling me down and I got short. And then I made a really big bluff with 9-2 off suit and I showed it to him like, I'm here to play buddy. And you know, it was in good fun. Like I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a dick to him. It was, it was more like, you're in a dog fight right now and I don't think you're ready for this. And um, I did have a fortunate hand go my way that swung the title for me. Um, but I really feel like I was destined to win that tournament. And there's something also that happens as, as the short stack, because I was short throughout the final table, the final few days, I had nothing to lose. And I had that mentality and I know my opponents could feel that I was fearless and that I was hungry. And they were kind of playing from a place that was more, they had something to lose because they were the, they were, they had the expectation to win, you know, mm -hmm. like everyone was expecting them to win or, or get second. So, I think that that was really on my side and I really, yeah, I really channeled that kind of ferocity and the, the cards broke my way in that one big pot that, that shifted it for me. Yeah. And if you have, like, if, like I said, if you haven't seen the inaugural episode of Embrace the Grind, episode number one, and Andrew and I really dive into the origins of your career, you know, starting with the $5 sit and goes in basements and, you know, moving to Vegas with no money in your bank account renting furniture, playing one, three, going broke, borrowing money, uh, leaving the game for maybe a couple months one time and realize and getting a job, getting a job at card player as like a customer support person. Yeah. I think you lasted a month there before you realized that poke, you had to get back into poker. Um, but 20 years of 20 years of, uh, starting from the literal bottom of poker and working your way up to where you can even afford to pay $10,000 buy-ins. Uh, you don't need staking. You're not a backed player. You know, it's all self-made. And to say that I'm proud of you is an understatement. And to say that I'm not inspired to work harder on my game is an understatement. And it's well-deserved. I'm so happy, bro. It's just, you know, it's, it's so great. I urge you guys to go back and watch first episode. Um, but that's that's going to do it for this episode of Embrace the Grind. I, I I needed to catch everyone up with what happened. It was just magical. It was a magical ride. Yeah, it was it was quite incredible. I'll just say one more thing about the tournament that is probably the most special thing for me because it's been such a long journey and because I've I really felt like I've always wanted to really legitimize myself in in the minds of my peers and and the people in my industry and. I wanted to be in this long form structure where the, the good players have the edge. You know, you're playing deep stacked the whole tournament with really tough players. And I wanted to I wanted to win this tournament and show the poker world that I'm not just this kid that plays these little tournaments and cash games and is, you know, just this like run of the mill poker player. I am a world-class player and I do belong and I feel like this tournament was my statement to my to myself but also to the poker world and to me that's that's how I see this thing and that's what makes it really special for me yeah well thanks again brother it's just so amazing like I, I said you, I love you too brother <laughs> so so happy for you and like I said if you haven't seen the first episode of embrace the grind I urge you to check that one out so you can get the origins of Andrew's story there is more to come on Embrace the Grind. I will be having Andrew on all the time as a co-host, as a guest. It's basically conversations with my brother on a regular basis, but we have all kinds of guests coming up soon that I know people are going to be excited about inside the poker world and outside the poker world. Thanks again for joining us on this episode, seeing the trophy here, the big check, the tournament that you won last week. We're going to have to get another painting of uh, the Win Millions. Thanks again. We'll see you on a future episode. Embrace the grind. I'm going to give it all I got, all I got. I'm grinding every day.